I'd like to ask Barbara now to come, come and uh, read the scripture this morning. And I should have said, I'd like you to remain standing for just a couple of verses of scripture. Would you stand out of reverence for the reading of God's word? Someday I will get everything right. But that day is probably the day the Lord's going to take me home. All right. All right. This is James chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enemy against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated for real. <laughs> well, this is a strong word James has for us this morning. It's basically telling us we have an either or proposition before us. We can either be friends with the world and with worldly ways, or we can be faithful in our sacred marriage with God. You know, that's why he uses the terminology adultery. Because God is our spouse. We know that in Revelation, Christ is referred to as the bridegroom, and the church is his bride. We are the bride of Christ. And that metaphor of marriage, a marriage between God and his people, is also used in the Old Testament as well. But today, I think we have a little less, or a little less sense of what that really means, because marriage, at least in America, has suffered greatly. It's a, it's a less effective comparison, because marriage is very often seen as disposable, temporary, and not even a consideration, in some of the younger generations, it's not even a consideration. You know, they're, they're basically uh, cohabitating without marriage. But what James is reminding us is that that sacred marriage, that faithful marriage between us and God, if we drift away from that, if we have friendship with the world, we're committing adultery against our Lord. I mean, even adultery in our society doesn't have the same scandalous reaction that it used to have. It seems almost commonplace. And if it's not physical adultery, you've also got the, the fantasy of adultery. I mean, in this world, with all the things that are available on social media and the internet in general, adultery through pornography or adultery through just uh, lustfully gazing is, is bigger than ever. Yet James reminds us that God wants total faithfulness in marriage to him. Adultery in that relationship is the worst possible betrayal of our Creator. Giving oneself over to the ways of the world rejects his love and denies his authority. And this problem is not just in the world around us, it's actually in the church as well. You know, if you think of sort of mainstream religion or conventional religion in our country today, it tends to follow the trends of the society in terms of uh, worldview and morality. It shares a lot in common with society. Uh, even Christians often rationalize the way in which they resemble the culture by saying, hey, I'm pretty much a good person. I might commit some little small sins, but those aren't hurting anyone. I'm not like those really big, bad sinners out there. You know, this is, this is the slippery slope of friendship with the world. And it's getting to be commonplace. 
Now, these observations about where we are in terms of the church and its relationship to society uh, are supported by some actually hard data that was put together by the Barna Group. I've referred to their surveys before. They, they focus in on Christianity and they ask questions that are important to Christians and how Christians interrelate with the world. And then they publish the results of those surveys. So today I'm referring to one of those that they put together eight years ago. It came out eight years ago, 2016, which identified that we are in America have created a new morality. And they called that new morality a morality of self-fulfillment. And the bad part about it is, folks, that Christians tend to agree with about five or six tenets of this morality of self-fulfillment. And we need to wake up that, that this is actually friendship with the world. This is actually adultery against God. We need to have God's wisdom and discernment as we make the decisions we make and as we think the thoughts we think. So I want to spend some time today just carefully looking at these five or six tenets of a morality of self-fulfillment and how Christians relate to those. So the first one is, is the, a tenant of this new morality, the best way to find yourself is to look inside yourself. Look inside. The best way to find yourself is to look inside yourself. Now, among U.S. adults, 91% agreed with this statement. 91%. That's the general population, all U.S. adults. But when you look at Christians, it was 76%. So less, but, but still a huge majority. 76% agree with the best way to find yourself is looking inside yourself. This is a question about, this is a, a statement about identity. It basically says your identity is found by gazing at your own belly button. That it prioritizes the individual and the individual's experience and perception of themselves. Basically, it goes something like this. I'm going to study myself. I'm going to look into myself, and I'm going to assess myself based on my own criteria. I don't need any input from any other people. I don't need any other perspectives. You worry about you, and I'm going to worry about me, and we'll just be okay. Now, if I look inside and I think I'm a great person, well, world, you better watch out. Here I come. Now, if I look inside and I think, man, I'm so messed up, I'm such a failure, well, the conclusion there might be, I might as well do myself in. See, when you decide who you are, just based on your own criteria and gazing at your belly button, you've got two things that are very likely. One is... You're either going to have egomania or you're going to think lowly of yourself and have low self-esteem. But scripture says that our true identity is determined by our relationship with Christ. Paul made this absolutely clear in Galatians chapter 2, starting partway through verse 19, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And basically what Paul is saying here is, I live by faith in Christ, who died for me, even me, on the cross. And my identity is now linked with Christ, now and always. See, conventional religion, or mainstream religion, unfortunately, the relationship to Christ is just a passing acquaintance. People hear about Christ from time to time. For many of those in mainstream religion, the only time they hear about Christ is probably Christmas and Easter. It's a passing acquaintance with Christ. But what Paul reminds us is we were called to a union with Christ, a unity with Christ, and our identity is in Christ. 
And when our identity is in Christ and Christ is in us, we are on the same track with God, with his will and with his purposes. Our life is intertwined with his. We look to him as the source of our authority. We don't rely on common sense or popular wisdom. And we are free. We are actually a free people, truly free, because we're free from our sins. And we're free from our self and our selfishness, thanks to Christ. All right, here's tenet number two of morality of self-fulfillment. People can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. People can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. 79% of adults in the U.S. overall agreed with that, and 61%, still a majority of Christians, agreed with that as well. People can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. Here is the phenomenon of everyone is entitled to their own truth. Your truth may not, not be the same as my truth, but as long as you sincerely believe in your truth, you're good to go. And no one has the right to discourage you or dissuade you from your personal truth. You can believe whatever you want to believe. We must tolerate all beliefs. But you know, this philosophy undermines the reality of objective truth. Objective truth says there are some things that are true and factual, and there are other things that are false. An objective statement is a factual statement. It has definite correspondence with reality. And it's independent of anyone's feelings or biases. Now, Scripture says that with God's help, we human beings can discern objective truth. In fact, it's a characteristic of a God that he reveals truth to his people. He is a revealer of truth. He, he wants the people he loves to know the truth. And our role as Christ followers... One of our roles is to share that truth with others, to reveal that truth to others. We see this in Paul's advice to his protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. That's one of our job descriptions, to rightly explain the word of truth. Jesus also indicated that his disciples would be a people who live by truth, the truth that he's revealed. In John chapter 8, verse 31, we read, Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You see, the truth brings freedom because we know the truth. The truth is a person. He's Jesus Christ. And what he says is true. And we know that Jesus has the truth. We also know that this book, inspired by the Holy Spirit, contains truth. It tells us the truth about ourselves it also tells us the truth about God. So what Jesus has done is he has removed all the deceptions of the devil, all the distortions caused by self-centeredness and brokenness. He's removed those. We see God clearly, and we also see ourselves clearly because we know ourselves through the truth that God has revealed. All right, number three of... Morality of self-fulfillment states, people should not criticize someone else's life choices. Do not criticize someone else's life choices. This was agreed to by 89% of U.S. adults and 76% of practicing Christians. 
This is the let and let live philosophy. Uh, it basically says there is nothing worse than being intolerant. In other words, our culture says it is extremely intolerant. Our, I'm sorry. Our culture is extremely intolerant of intolerance. Isn't that a contradiction? It's a little bit of a hypocrisy there. Being extremely intolerant of intolerance. People who agree with this view, they often rely on misusing a quotation of Jesus. What they say is basically, judge not, least ye be judged. And what they mean by that is, uh, leave me alone, I'm going to do it my way. That's really what they're saying when they quote Jesus there. But scripture says all your life choices matter to God and that Christ followers in particular have a responsibility to weigh in on each other's choices when they sin. Paul tells the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 15, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Paul reminds us that how we live genuinely matters. We are called to conduct, to conduct and behavior that accords with God's wisdom. We need to know God's wisdom and live by it, not by common sense. And by God's wisdom, we can discern the difference between good and evil. We can see that thanks to God. And when we cross those boundaries of God's standard, we sin. And that means we're being unfaithful to God. That's adultery against God. When any Christ follower sins, it's our job description as Christians, another one of our job descriptions, to call each other on it. And Jesus told us this in Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 15, where he says, If your brother sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If you are listened to, you have regained that one. So, fellow Christians, we have a responsibility to one another. Whenever any one of us sins against another, we must address those life choices amongst ourselves, but we do it privately, one-on-one, -on -one, with the primary purpose of restoring that person, bringing that person back to the path of God. It's never about criticism or trying to humiliate that other person, or trying to elevate ourselves as being superior somehow, it's always done in love, attempting to reconnect that other person with God and with others. So remember that misuse of the phrase, judge not, least ye be judged? Well, we need to remember that that phrase came in a passage where Jesus was cautioning believers about having humility, have humility. He said, do not judge, so you may not be judged. For the judgment you give will be the judgment you get. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. That was in Matthew chapter 7. So the phrase, judge not, least ye be judged, isn't a free pass for anyone who wants to behave in any way that suits them. It's a caution that when we do speak to one another and hold each other accountable for the actions we commit, we do so having examined ourselves first, and recognize that we are sinners as well, that we are sinners who are, are, are made holy by Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he's made. So we come to others with gratitude and also humility, recognizing that we sinned also. We're not any better. We're all made better by Jesus, not by ourselves. And that's what qualifies us 
to weigh in, to help others who are wrestling with sin. And as the passage says, we, we go to that other person and we help them with that speck in their eye. It's not, it's not completely banned. It's that we have to do it with humility. That's a far cry from the idea that we ought to live and let live. All right, number four says, to be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire most. To be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire most. I hope as you're listening to these, you're asking yourself as you hear them, well, have I ever agreed with this? Apparently, 86% of all U.S. adults agreed with that statement. And 72% of practicing Christians agreed you should pursue the things you desire most. This is the uh, follow your heart philosophy. Uh, you deserve to be happy. Uh, he who dies with the most toys wins. That kind of thing. Uh, this, this tends to result in people who pursue uh, wealth and power and possessions. And when you ask them how much is enough, you know, when do you need to stop? When have you gotten enough? They say, well, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And you see, in this philosophy, your own desire, the individual's desire, is what sets the course. Everything you do in your life is just based on your own desires. But Scripture says that the fulfilled life is one centered on God and the things of God. So if we look at something like Psalm 37, verse 4. You've heard this one before. Psalm 37, verse 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of, his, of your heart. See, if we put the Lord first, if we delight in the Lord first, everything else falls into place. The interesting thing here is, if you delight in the Lord, if you have intimacy in your relationship with God, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, Basically, you've already got the greatest thing you can possibly desire. You have God in your life. He is the most desirable being in all the universe. And a relationship with him is the most fulfilling thing any human being can experience. Also remember what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6. He, he basically was saying, you know, people chase after food and clothing, and they worry about those things. But he says, uh, you instead should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So Jesus was saying, even your most basic needs, put those lower than God and God's kingdom. Let alone your desires, your basic needs can be set aside if you focus on God's kingdom and doing what's right and pursue relationship with him. Seek to please him by doing the things that are right and everything else will fall into place. All right, here's number five. The highest goal of life is to enjoy it as much as possible. The highest goal of life is to enjoy it as much as possible. This was agreed to by 84% of all U.S. adults and 67% uh, of practicing Christians. What we're talking about here is the eat, drink, and be merry lifestyle. Go for the gusto, carpe diem, seize the day. It's reflected in statements like uh, this one from the actress Katherine Hepburn. She said, if you obey all the rules, you miss all the fun. Or the novelist uh, Rita Mae Brown said, I finally figured out the only reason to be alive is to enjoy it. According to this viewpoint, happiness depends upon ourselves just squeezing as much juice as we can out of this life we have. In short, this is a philosophy that tends towards uh, personal pleasure being the highest goal. 
But Scripture cautions us that a hedonistic or a pleasure-seeking goal for life is selfish and foolish. Jesus told the parable, maybe you remember it, about a, a wealthy uh, landowner who decided he was going to harvest everything and store it in barns, and then he was going to live off of it for the rest of his life. He was going to eat, drink, and be merry the rest of his life. And God spoke to him and said, you are a fool because this day your life is demanded from you. In other words, this man was planning for a life of pleasure, but he was not focusing on the things of God. Being a Christ follower, being in an intimate relationship with God, isn't focused on experiencing pleasure all the time, nor is it about being miserable all the time. We don't have to be dour and depressed all the time. But our main goal is to pursue the one, follow the one, who stepped down from the Godhead to walk the dusty streets of Jerusalem. Jesus surrendered his highest position in order to save us. The Apostle Paul walked in Jesus' footsteps by bringing the gospel with joy to the whole world, but he suffered for it. He suffered for the sake of spreading the gospel. In Philippians, he comments in Philippians 4, starting in verse 11, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, if we prioritize God and the purposes of God in our lives, there may be occasions where we suffer for it, but that doesn't mean we have to have a sour attitude about life. Instead, we live life with joy, realizing that other people are pursuing things that are meaningless. But we have a life of meaning and joy and relationship with our Creator. And we can share His love and His truth with others. And He, in turn, shares enormous power with us. He gives us a portion of His power as Paul says, I can do all things, through, all things through Christ who strengthens me. He sustains us in good times and in bad times. All right, I know you're wondering how many of these tenants are there. I did mention five or six. This is number six. That's the last one. Last one. Number six says, any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. Any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. That was agreed to in 2018. That was agreed to by 60% of U.S. adults. I am sure the number is way higher now than it was eight years ago. Um, it was agreed to by 40% of practicing Christians eight years ago. But I found a more recent study, a Pew study, that asked a similar question in 2020. And that showed that 57% of Christians agreed with this view. So the number is going up. That any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. Again, here we have a prioritized, a prioritization of pleasure for pleasure's sake. It's, it, this is a specific case of eat, drink, and be merry. What's happened in our society is that sexual pleasure has been severed from a sacred relationship of marriage. It's no longer thought of as one of the aspects of deep intimacy in a commit, committed couple, and even the intent to have children is hardly ever present. It's only about the pleasure of the act itself. And what this perspective on sex has resulted in is, as I mentioned earlier, cohabitation without marriage. Many, many more people are just not opting for marriage. 
And many would say the only guardrails as far as sexual activity is concerned is uh, it must be consensual, both adults must agree to what they're doing, uh, and also it must not hurt anyone. Maybe it would be the second guardrail. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, it doesn't matter if you have uh, multiple partners, that's fine. Same-sex relationships, no problem. Just be sure to use protection so no one gets a disease, okay? We're good. Now, Scripture shows us that Jesus clearly establishes a higher standard for human sexuality. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 27 through 29, you can find there Jesus saying, you know, other people have told you don't commit adultery. I tell you, even if you look upon a woman who is not your wife with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery already. So Jesus is not concerned only about acts of adultery, physical acts. He's concerned about people who have sunk their whole hearts into an adulterous fantasy. And they are way off course in terms of God's plan for sexuality and marriage. The sin of adultery is committed with the eyes and a heart full of lust. There's no need to actually make it to the bedroom. Now, folks, this is a prime example of that slippery slope of friendship with the world. You know, the world says this is okay, no problem. And a popular defense of same-sex relationships, for instance, is Jesus never said anything about that stuff. They say Jesus never commented on homosexuality, so no problem here. We should have no problem with this, folks. But what these people fail to credit and recognize is that Jesus affirmed God's plan for marriage of one woman, one man, in marriage. Mark chapter 10, verses uh, 6 through 9, Jesus um, affirms this. He talks about how a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. He's reiterating God's plan is one woman, one man in marriage. So he doesn't need to explicitly rule out everything else. That covers it, folks. He doesn't need to go into every nitty gritty of every possible sexual immorality. And another thing, he doesn't need to specifically condemn types of sexual immorality is because he has affirmed everything God commanded and, and taught in the Old Testament. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus affirms the moral commandments of God in the Old Testament and God's plan designed for marriage to be between, between a one man and one woman in holy matrimony, and that is the venue for human sexuality. Recreational sex, purely for the sake of momentary pleasure, is out of bounds in God's plan. And scripture calls this sexual immorality. Alright, so you've heard the six tenets of a morality of self-fulfillment, which are extremely prominent in our society today, and they're also in our church today. We need to recognize, folks, that these tenets are, the, are exactly what James is talking about when he says, avoid friendship with the world, you make yourself enemies of God. So instead of making ourselves enemies of God, let us discern the truth of God. Let us take it to heart and recognize that our identity is in Christ, that we live under his authority, and we do so joyously. It's the best relationship you can have in the world. We are a people who are truly free because God has set us free from our sins. He set us free from ourselves. Let us draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are grateful for the truth of your word. We are thankful, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that reveals that truth to us and helps us to apply it to our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding us of everything Jesus has said and taught. Lord God, as we go from here, please, Lord, help us to apply these truths to our lives, to recognize where we are on that slippery slope of friendship with the world. Lord, we want more and more to draw close to you, to experience that friendship with you, that holy matrimony with you. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, as we sing our last song together, I will remind you, stay put after we have the dismissal. Stay put. We're going to have a very brief board meeting, okay? So don't go anywhere. We're just going to immediately call the meeting to order.